I have quite a few slides. I have quite a few slides uh, to 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 show. Um, I'll try and stick to my 20 minutes. Uh, I'll just start off uh, first of all by thanking uh, Piotr and colleagues for for inviting uh, myself. In fact, the original invitation went to my colleague Enrique Fernandez Macias, uh, with whom I worked on the European Jobs Monitor uh, at uh, the European Foundation. We've been working on this project for a number of years. Um, what I'm going to show you is actually not uh, the annual report, uh, our recent annual report, copies of which are outside, but just a more general reflection on the whole debate on employment polarization based on some of our own data and also some, some external data. Um, so that's my, uh, my, first, uh, my first apology. Um, my, my second apology is, uh, just in advance, is that I'm going to actually talk a bit about uh, against technology as one of the main uh, drivers of uh, uh, shifts in the employment structure. Um, so maybe I'm in the wrong session. I'll let you judge. <laughs> So, first of all, uh, uh, a brief outline of the presentation. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the jobs approach, which is this, uh, the, this basic structural uh, methodology for looking at shifts in, uh, shifts in employment, by, primarily by sector and occupation, but also uh, ranked in terms of the job quality of the jobs um, that we use and that we've borrowed from some American, uh, American researchers uh, who have um, applied a similar method in the past from the 1990s onwards. Then I'm going to ask uh, how are employment structures in developed countries changing? Are they polarizing? Are they upgrading? Uh, or are there other observable uh, patterns of change that we see? Uh, and then I'm going to ask a few questions about what, what are the factors driving these changes? Uh, technology is certainly one of the important ones, but is it, but is it the only one? And I, I'll make some brief conclusions. To start off with, the jobs approach. Well, the jobs approach is, uh, as I say, is a structural approach to analyzing employment change um, principally uh, ha and has principally been applied to, um, to developed economies. What it does is um, it takes the principal uh, survey data from the labor force surveys that, which we have in all of our countries. It ranks jobs. Um, um, it, it, it divides the workforce into, into jobs or into units uh, of uh, similar, uh, similar productive activity. Um, we call jobs, in our particular application, we refer to uh, jobs, um, or we define jobs as occupations in sectors. So uh, here you see some examples. Um, on the left, Corporate managers in financial services uh, would be a top, uh, one of the top paid jobs. Uh, sales machine and plant operators in, manu in auto manufacturing often would, would appear in the mid, uh, the mid paid jobs as a mid paid job or craft workers in food manufacture. So you have some idea of, what, of how we're breaking down um, employment in each country that we apply this method to. Um, what we do is we rank the jobs, having, broke them, having broken employment up into a matrix of occupations and sectors, uh, often amounting to about 1,000 or 1,500 job cells, including employment, uh, in, in each country. Uh, we then rank those jobs in terms of their median pay. Um, and having ranked them, we assign them to quintiles. Uh, the top jobs go to the high-paid uh, high quintile. And, and you go right down to the fifth quintile, which is the low paid, the, the, the lower paid jobs. And then what we do is we just simply, um, uh, we, do this, uh, we do this assignment to quintiles based on, uh, uh, based on employment and wage data in a beginning period. And afterwards, what we just show is the net employment shift for, for each period uh, by quintile. And we do this for each member state. So in this final chart on the right uh, that, that you see, you see basically the, the, the typical quintile chart that, uh, that kind of uh, is the, the main graphic tool for presenting our, presenting our results. So you see for this period, this is EU27 or EU28, I think, uh, between 2011 and 2013. You see um, uh, modest growth uh, on, in low-paid jobs, very modest, just above uh, zero, uh, zero percent per annum. You see significant growth in, growth in top-paid jobs and very significant destruction in the middle. So this is just a sample period and this is just an idea of getting you used to the method uh, of how we present the data. This is, a, this is a chart showing two periods uh, of employment expansion. On the left, we have uh, the United States from 1992 to 2000, um, from the work of Eric Olin Wright and Rachel Dwyer. 
Um, and on the right, we have the EU23. This is um, a, we, we, we missed out some countries in this analysis uh, due to data restrictions. Unfortunately, Poland was one of them. Um, Romania was the other, and I think two smaller, two smaller member states were also excluded from this, uh, this data run that we did. But it covers the period 1998 to 2007. Um, a comparable period of employment expansion in Europe uh, to that which was experienced in the States uh, in, in the 90s. Um, what do you see? Well, the, the main thing that you see is uh, there are very, very similar patterns of uh, employment shift. This is mar these are marginal changes in absolute employment. So the, uh, two, what you are seeing here, for instance, in Europe in the top quintile is that there was over 8 million New, net new jobs created in the top quintile, in jobs in the top quintile of employment between 98 and 2007. The comparable figure for uh, the US is around five, five and a quarter million. But th the interesting thing is that the two uh, charts have a very, very similar shape. And there are three basic, three main distinguishing features. Relatively strong growth at the top, in the top, in well-paid and well, uh, high-skilled jobs. Uh, relatively weak growth in the middle uh, and some some, uh, something in between, if you like, in the bottom, uh, in the bottom quintile. When labor economists talk about polarization, it's generally this type of uh, polarization that they're talking about. It's not symmetrical polarization. It's not pure hollowing out. It's actually asymmetrical polarization. It's generally skewed towards uh, employment at the top of the wage distribution. What are the explanatory hypotheses? Well, again, there, there, there is a, 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 a rather canonical explanation, which is skill-biased technological change, which uh, certainly accounts for some of the changes that we observe. Te uh, skill-biased technological change uh, says that um, employment, demand for employment is biased towards um, uh, is biased towards higher skilled, higher skilled work. It uh, complements uh, higher, skilled, uh, higher skilled workers, makes them more productive, and increases the demand for them. Uh, it tends to displace uh, workers uh, at the lower end of the wage uh, distribution. It uh, reduces the demand for low skilled jobs. Um, and the theoretical prediction is that this uh, effect should be linear across the wage distribution. But of course, what we see is that uh, actually it seems to it seems to, the theoretical prediction seems to match the data for the top three quintiles, but it seems to fall off in terms of its explanatory power near the bottom. So the explanatory hypothesis, the refinement of the explanatory hypothesis is uh, what we know as the t uh, task or routine bias technological change. Um, um, this uh, refinement uh, holds that we should, um, we should classify jobs in terms of tasks, and we should, uh, we should classify those tasks in terms of two axes, uh, whether the extent to which they're routine and also the extent to which they're cognitive or non-cognitive. Um, the interesting thing about this is, without going into too much detail, is that actually uh, it, uh, it predicts the hollowing out uh, of the, uh, of the uh, employment structure better than uh, its, its father uh, father theory, if you like, uh, skill bias technological change. Because routine jobs tend to prevail in the middle of the, uh, of the wage distribution, it, it, it actually matches the, this kind of Nike curve that we have here. Uh, it tends to actually predict this much better than skill bias technological change. The, the routine jobs are being lost in the middle. The non-routine jobs tend to cluster at either end of the wage distribution. So what you have here is you have um, uh, an explanatory hypothesis which seems to match the actual observed data, at least in two of the major developed uh, economies, uh, rather well. In fact, it's a, uh, it really is a remarkable marriage of, an, of a neat theory and, um, uh, and some very obliging data. For Europe, we've done this analysis, and this is for various. Uh, this is for the EU as a whole. Again, different um, different uh, configurations of the EU, but uh, from 23 to 28 member states, but for different periods. What you see is on from 1998 to 2007, you see the this classic asymmetrical polarization that we were talking about. All of the job growth. This is uh, these figures are sorry are just uh, in terms of percent uh, percentage employment growth per annum per quintile. So you see uh, on the left, you see the figure that I've just shown you, um, uh, asymmetrical polarization, job growth in all quintiles, and concentrated towards the top. 
2008 to 2010, and rather significant and massive destruction of employment, uh, very much concentrated in the, mid, uh, in the middle quintiles. Uh, a softening of that, uh, of that job loss in the, the, uh, the period of 2011 to 2013. You see a continuing resilience of, uh, of employment in the top quintile. Um, and it's only more recently that you see some change in the uh, change in the the, uh, the figure, the, the the pattern of the data. You actually see in the most recent year of data, you see uh, a predominance of employment growth in in bottom quintiles. Um, but generally speaking, you could you could make a case for all of these four charts uh, over different periods being a polarization of some of some description. Um, polarization is largely explained uh, by for techn technological uh, by technological um, uh, reasons and the um, it's the technological effects on the on the uh, on the demand for labor that uh, are primary in both of the main canonical explanations to the extent that technology acts on our labor markets uh, it can be assumed and it certainly is the assumption of most labor economists is that it acts across uh, it, it acts in similar ways across countries technology is not national in that sense uh, this is a very important uh, it's a very important point because what we are seeing here in this data is that uh, there seems to be some consistency in the, the observed data in periods of employment expansion in the United States and the Europe we're also seeing in Europe uh, broadly speaking that there's some uh, there's polarization that we observe consistently over nearly the last two two decades at aggregate if this pattern was to be repeated at national level uh, then we would have a very, very strong sense that uh, technology was the prime uh, determinant of shifts in the employment structure in our, in our economies. And this case has been made by Goose, uh, 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 Martin Goose and Alan Manning about European countries. They say that 15, in 15 out of 16 countries there was um, polarizing employment shifts uh, in the 90s and early 2000s. We don't find the same thing. We do the data, uh, we've done the data from 1995 onwards in, mo in many uh, European countries um, and in different uh, periodizations. And what we find is a variety of different, uh, different patterns. This is just for the period 2011-2014. I'm afraid it's too small for you to, to, to look at the data uh, uh, or to go through the data in any type of detail. But just to say that what we see is we see a variety of different patterns. We see some upgrading countries, uh, Austria and Belgium in this case, some polarizing countries, clearly polarizing countries, Spain and the UK uh, at the bottom, and then some, some countries which are actually downgrading uh, in the period, Hungary and Italy. Um, but what we see is really a variety of different patterns. And if I show you any other period, including the period from 1998 to 2007, you, you, you would also see a variety of patterns, uh, generally uh, on the upgrading or polarizing uh, side, um, but some hybrids, hybrids as well. So that's the first point. There is a variety of uh, employment shift patterns across countries. The second point is that there's also a variety. If you look at the, the main proponent of employment polarization, one of the, um, the, the authors of the idea, if you like, uh, David Autor, in his own work uh, covering the, the um, uh, changes in the American, uh, the American employment data, uh, from 1979 onwards, we see also that there are very significant shifts uh, over time in the observed patterns of employment change. This is, uh, this is a slightly different graphical presentation of the data, but effectively it's very, very similar to what I'm I was showing you before. Instead of uh, uh, quintiles, um, we're showing you smooth percentile changes. Um, so percentile 0 to 100, uh, 0 on the left, 100 to the right. Uh, on the right, you have uh, the, the high-paid jobs, high-skilled jobs. On the left, uh, the lower-paid and lower-skilled jobs. Um, and if you chart, uh, each of these lines charts a, a decade's employment, uh, employment shift. Um, 1979 to 1989 is the blue line, which begins... Um, I'll see if I can use this malarkey. Yeah. So this, this blue line... Uh, covers the period, covers the 1980s basically, uh, this, the decade of employment growth in the 1980s. What you see is that uh, the growth is very much upward skewed, there's some kink at the bottom, uh, but basically it's a, a more of an upgrading type of pattern. The red line is the next line, 1989 to 1999. Again, you, it's slightly moderating now and it's becoming a little bit more polarized. And as we go 
decade by decade, it becomes, uh, it goes from upgrading to more polarized to, sorry, to, to more polarized again. Excuse me. To more polarized again until the most recent data actually shows that the majority of employment growth is at the bottom of the wage distribution in the EU. So from 2000 onwards, actually it's lower paid jobs which, uh, which have been experiencing faster employment growth. This is uh, not uh, consistent with, uh, the uh, with any of the, the theories that we've talked about, the technological uh, change theories. Um, this is something which requires probably a new theory or a new way of thinking about uh, uh, why uh, advanced economy employment structures are changing. As I said, the main explanations for, for change have been primarily the canonical theories are technology-based, uh, skills bias techn technical change on the one hand and routine bias technical change on the other hand. We would say that there are lots of other things happening and that they have to be taken into account and that they, they at least, if you take into account some of these factors, uh, you might be able to account better for the types of vari variation both across time and across country uh, in what's happening to our labor markets. Trade is certainly cited quite a lot in uh, trade globalization and trade competition effects are cited uh, uh, in a lot of the labor ec economics literature, but often as a kind of, a, uh, as a country cousin uh, to the main, uh, to the main technology, um, technology based effects. Um, labor market institutions and general institutions don't get much of a reading in, in, in a lot of the labor economics literature. Um, by this I'm referring to labor market regulation and policies, but also the very important role of the state as an employer. Uh, the state employs, uh, directly or indirectly, as many as 40% of, uh, of, of workers in some of the Nordic countries and, and as few as 15% in some of the, the, some of the south, south Eastern European countries. So there are very, very big, uh, very, very big differences in, in, in some of these very policy-related uh, uh, variables and, and very big differences between countries. And we think these should be taken into account. Um, there are also very, very important uh, labor market supply factors. And I, I, I know Andrea, uh, who will talk to you later, has, has talked about them in his paper on uh, the anatomy of polarization in the UK. Um, Daniel Lush as well, uh, in some very important work uh, he's done on occupational changes in the EU, also refers to the importance of them. These are labor market supply factors. They're also broad dimensions of social change which impact on labor market structure. Um, we're talking about the increased female participation, we're talking about migration, uh, and we're talking about educational upskilling. Two, three very, very broad uh, social trends, but trends which clearly have a, a demonstrable effect on our, on our labor markets. And then finally, from our own work, uh, we think that macroeconomic variables also have, a, have an impact, the growth rate, the stage of economic development, and the stage of the business cycle. It seems to be the case that in periods of recession, you do have a sharpening of uh, employment polarization. That's what we observed in the EU at aggregate level, and uh, in the countries where the recession hit most, you see the clearest examples of uh, employment polarization. And there are other, uh, there are other, uh, there are other things that may as well be affecting employment structures. But just to say, we want, to, we think it would be useful to actually, uh, to say that we see more variety than we would expect if a single, simple technological explanation of employment changes was uh, was the, was the simple story behind what we observe in the empirical data. And we think all of these factors may play a role. And just to support that, this is a. Um, we can decompose these quintiles in terms of gender, in terms of age, in terms of any of the standard demographic variables. In this case, what I've done is, uh, done is I've decomposed the quintile, in the employment shifts by quintile, uh, in terms of core, uh, core standard employment relationship, those in working in full-time permanent work, on the one hand, in, in dark blue, and those in Light blue are uh, those in non-standard or atypical work. So anybody who's doing, anyone who is self-employed, who is part-time, uh, or who has a fixed-term contract. Now, there are really, I said there were three stories when we talk about polarization. There are really only two stories when we talk about, uh, when we, when we, when we look at um, um, the distribution of wage, uh, the distribution of employment changes by wages on the one hand and by uh, uh, standard or non-standard employment uh, on the other hand. 
you have the top quintile where employment is growing, you have the top quintile where, only, uh, where nearly all of that growth or where a very significant amount of that growth is, growth is permanent and full-time work. This is for the EU28 from 2011 to 2014, by the way, and these figures uh, on, the, on the left are absolute employment shifts. So one million, over one million net new permanent and full-time jobs in the top quintile jobs, uh, half a million uh, jobs at the left and right, excuse me, um, broadly, just to, just to conclude, we see polarization of atypical employment. We see growth in four quintiles for atypical employment. We see uh, destruction of employment and more significant employment destruction in permanent and full-time jobs. This is a, in, this short in, in this short period, there's been a significant reduction and a, a significant swapping of uh, permanent core uh, employment relationships for uh, non-standard employment relationships. This is ongoing, and it's ongoing in all of our economies. We see that permanent and full-time work is actually contributing more to upgrading and atypical employment is growing, uh, growing employment both in the bottom, job, bottom paid jobs and in top paid jobs. So we think that this is uh, reasonable uh, circumstantial evidence that uh, uh, trends in terms of employment deregulation uh, and in terms of uh, the non-standardization of the employment relationship may be contributing to, uh, may be contrib contributing to the polarization that we do observe. Some brief conclusions. There is a variation of employment shifts across time and across countries. Uh, most of the, these um, uh, revolve, uh, are either polarization, clear polarization, clear upgrading, or some hybrid of the two. More recent data from the EU and the US indicates a possibly emerging pattern of employment downgrading. Um, this is based on very tentatively on one, one or two years of data from, the, from Europe, but it's a much clearer pattern in the recent American data uh, from 2000 onwards. This has some echoes in low levels of productivity growth, especially post-crisis, um, and it gives some support or uh, it reinforces, if you like, uh, the, uh, the hypothesis of secular stagnation. Um, in, in, in the developed market economies. Permanent and full-time status is increasingly the privilege of well-paid jobs, uh, which argues that there may be some impact of uh, employment deregulation and shifting in the shifting institutional framework of labor uh, on uh, pa uh, observed patterns of employment change. And finally, technology computerization. It is an important vector of change, certainly, but it cannot be the only explanation. There must be other things going on to explain the variety that we see both across time uh, and across countries. Thank you very much.